Uh, now we're going to move into our uh, future presentation today, which is going to be done by Houston Oasis members Lori Griffith and Brenda Lunger. Let's welcome them to the. <laughs> We're buying whichever CD has that yeah. song in yeah. it. <laughs> um, all right, so you might notice we have some posters and things around the room. This is interactive, but it's very friendly. We call this Gender 101 because we're not scientists, we're not psychologists, we are not experts in any way, shape, or form. We are telling you our story. We are giving you a different way of thinking about things. Um, and primarily what we're going to talk about is binaries. And, the, and as I mentioned in the community moment before, that binaries don't exist in nature. So I'm going to be calling for some volunteers. I need five volunteers. I need people who are willing to move about the room and answer questions about themselves by doing so and who will not trip on wires. <laughs> um, so if I could just get five volunteers and pick a, just pick a spot. Brenda, you're going to be at this one. I'm volunteering you. Um, okay. um, yeah, just pick a number to stand next to. And, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Four. Uh, yeah. Thank you. We need one guy, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's, there's five. Yeah, got five stations. Now, the purpose of these stations is our number one and our number five are the binaries. They're the extreme ends, they're the either or, the black and white, and you know, we ignore everything else that happens in between. Well, you'll notice I've got two, three, and four as well. So your three is going to be, you're like right in the middle, everything's even, you know, all things being equal, everything's even. Um, your two is, you're more in between what I've got going on here, and one, you're, you're just, mm, you kind of, and four is one way or the other this way. Okay, that's just the basic rundown. So the first thing we're going to talk about to, to start getting you on, on, on board our, our train with the, the fact that binaries don't exist is are you left-handed or right-handed? And most people tend to think this is an either-or. So move to the poster that has either a left hand or a right hand depending on which one is appropriate. Which one is left and which one is right? Oh, that's the right hand. So yeah, move to your right or your left. That's the right hand. No, that's the left hand. L. And y'all have all learned an important piece of trivia about Brenda. She does not know her left from her right. She has degrees in physics and chemical engineering. She's brilliant, but she does not know her left from her right. You would stand more. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Yay! Okay, Brenda's usually the only one who's in the ambidextrous. And that's my point, is that we're not either or. And even when you're, okay, you're getting dressed this morning. You didn't use just right hand or just left hand. When you're eating, you use both hands. So we think of these things in terms of, well, you're either this or you're that, but that's not the way we really function. Okay, so we're going to go through a couple more of these, and then I'm going to let Brenda get into the technical part of it. As I say, I do the kindergarten teacher friendly part, and then she does the more, more technical. All right, so the next question I'm going to ask is political affiliation. And, and I've, these things are very simplified, oversimplified. I've got an elephant over here. We don't have to call it Republican. We can call it Republican. We can call it conservative, you know, this, this end. Um, we got a more liberal over here. I put a leaf here because I was trying to come up with a symbol for a moderate, and, and so I went Green Party because I like it. <laughs> Which I realize it's not very moderate, but that's what's here. Okay! <laughs> we did this once before with, with uh, a political action group, and I had some guys go all the way to the wall. <laughs> the wall and go further. Yeah. <laughs> and so, okay. Um, well, with this group, an interesting question would actually, and one we've used before, and I didn't put symbols for it on there because there's so many to choose from, uh, would be we, a question we've used is religion. Are you theist, non theist, polytheist? You know? uh, but I won't make y'all go through that today. But we are very much looking forward to doing this talk today because you are a group that has already re-examined the norms, and re-examined the binary, and re-examined the musts, 
you must do this, and, and you've already broken out of that. So we're really looking forward to the Q&A part of our talk today more than usual because we're expecting interesting questions from this group. Are you going to do Texas? Texas or no, not this time. Um, so the volunteers, I will need you again at a later point in the talk, but now I'm turning it over to Brenda. Okay, as you can see, there's not too much binary here. Yeah, there, there are groupings. There are people all over the place. A binary is, you know, you can define it. You can go to um, MarianWebster.com is where I got this definition. Um, basically, when you think of binary in, let's go to the computer world, it's either a one or a zero. There's no half. Um, the issue is that nowhere in nature can you find a binary. I want you guys to think for about 30 seconds. If you have a binary that comes to mind, raise your hand. And if we have some, keep your hands up because I'll go through them and I'll bust them. <laughs> Okay, we've got four hands up, five hands up. Let's go from there. TC, you were first. You said this had to be in nature? Anywhere in nature. Mine's not really in nature. I'll put my hand well, down. Let's hear it, though. The refrigerator light is either on or it's off. Or it's broken. Well, it could, it could also be dimmer than normal. I mean, light, light and darkness. Light and darkness are not a binary. No matter what the Bible says. <laughs> Let's go right here. A uh, quantum state of an electron is either spin up or spin down. <laughs> okay. Now, can you prove that? Pretty much. Can you change the quantum state of an electron? From spin up to spin down? Yes. Yes, but... It's what does it pass through? Nothing. It's either up or down. You can't establish that. Not, physics has not established that yet. They haven't found the mid-state. I don't think there is one. But we don't think there is one, but it's, it, we can't establish it. As close as you're going to get. You have to get in. Actually, that's a damn good one. <laughs> yes. Uh, there's a tropical fish species, and I don't know, forgive me, I don't know the name of the species, but it's uh, quite well established genetically that uh, all, all members of the species, uh, male or female, it doesn't matter, come in either all black or all white, and they make no distinction among themselves when mating, etc., etc., when mixing, when traveling around. So they're either all black or all white, but it seems to make no difference to them. But that black-white difference is determined, at least in this fish species, by a single gene. You either have that gene or you don't have the gene, and then you're either all black or you're all white, and there's no gray, there's no anything like that. Ooh, that's a really good one. Um, I don't have the details on that. Now, is the black all exactly the same? As far as I know, I'm not an expert on it. I just read about this in my science magazine. And it's the white all the same. I mean, the thing is, again, we're, we're establishing a pure hard binary. So, right there. Pregnant or not pregnant. <laughs> okay. Now, there are different types of pregnancy. There are also um, certain... You're never a little bit pregnant. <laughs> You're never a little bit pregnant, but... What is the definition? Where does pregnancy come from? Pregnancy is a semantic term. And it depends on life, your definition of life. A fertilized egg, is that a pregnant woman? What happens if that fertilized egg flushes out the next day? No longer pregnant. Was she pregnant? We don't know. So in other words, to establish that binary is very, very hard. But, yes, that's a very close to a binary issue. This is close to some of these others we'll be talking about. One more. Inside an event horizon and outside an event horizon. You have to cross the event horizon. At some point, there is a crossing. Okay. So. Wow. And that would be why she does that part. <laughs> what we're really dealing with is not is the fact that trying to prove trying to prove a binary is a very hard thing. Disproving a binary takes one statement. And so that's really where we're going here. We have to realize that when 
when binaries, from a human standpoint, when we look at them, most of them are defined by language. Even the ones in physics, you have to cross, if, if there's an event horizon, there's a crossing. You know, if, there's, if there are two states that an electron can be in, there is some point at which there is a crossing. <coughs> So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I have a physics degree as well, yeah, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's get back to now to the, we're getting gender one. There's a gender binary that we talk about on that is far less binary than any of the ones you said here. One of the best ones I've heard before is living or dead. But the key is, when your body dies, how much of your body dies? Most of your body, you have many more microorganisms in you that are still alive than what is the, the human death. And so if we just define human death, well, you know, it's still not really a binary because we can resuscitate in many cases. But life versus death, no. So let's get into some definitions. Transgender is a person who is, and you'll hear this word identity and identified. A person who is identified at birth as male, who their internal identity is female, or vice versa, identified as female at birth and male in their internal identity. The key here is who identifies a person at birth? Doctor. The doctors. We are not born male and female. We are identified. We are defined without our consent by a doctor when we come out. What happens when a child is born with ambiguous genitalia? They surgically correct it almost immediately without parental consent. Without the parental consent and without the consent of the individual being corrected. Yep. Without parental consent? Okay. Yeah. Right. You might want to repeat the answer, Brenda, because... Okay. Yes. In many cases, the child is corrected without parental consent. Now, recently they've been going more toward parental consent but when I was born, there was no consent. The child was taken out, and you hear of situations where a child was just, oh, we had to do, we had to do a real brief procedure, to, and then they bring the child back. Yep. Um, there have been cases, and there's one book back there on the shelf, of a botched circumcision, circumcision where they um, reassigned the child based on that. And there was a doctor who made his living on how successfully this child adjusted to girlhood. This child committed suicide at the age of 34, I believe, and there's a book on it about, um, it, it, it was a tragic thing, and, but there was a time when people thought that they were God, and that's a problem with gods. Intersex is what we were just talking about, a child with ambiguous genitalia or some sort of genetic intersex condition which could not, could, might, might not even manifest in genitalia. And then we get to the great definition, the one I love, reality. Nature is a study in distributions, not binaries. Yeah, there are things that are very close to binary out there, but if you look at nature, if you look at how we've evolved, it's a, study in, it's a study in distributions, not in binaries. Now here's one of my favorite charts ever. Um, what's the normal distribution of a statistical population? The bell-shaped curve. That's just your standard normal distribution. But there are a lot of other distributions out there that exist in nature. If, for instance, you have a mountain, and you're dropping rocks on top of the sharp mountain, they're going to go one way or the other, or some of them might stop in the middle. One of them might hit and teeter right on the thing. You get a bimodal distribution. And my favorite part about this is, you know, since we're talking about gender, what does this make you think in terms of gender? <laughs> Great way to remember it. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, the male, the female, and the as yet undecided. Well, when you think of just female, you can think of also, this is a yeah. mnemonic device. Yeah. <laughs> But this is a standard distribution. In fact, this is one of the more common distributions in nature. And so we're going to look at a couple of distribution continuum that are out there. 
And Lori, this is your turn. You can come back up. And... All right, I need my volunteers again. <coughs> at this point, we're going to talk about assigned at birth. This is what the doctor said. And this is based on just a cursory glance, you know, peek under the skirt. The doctor said, so you can go to the one that has my female symbol, or you can come over here to the male. Not, yeah, not the joint one. This, this, this comes later. The joint one comes later. So just, just the larger symbol. Okay. Oh, and I don't, where's the, I don't Oh, you want to do this? Okay, okay, I was going to do it. Okay, no, you do it, because I don't know. All you have to do is roll the wheel. Okay. <laughs> you didn't tell me what I was doing. Self-identified gender. Okay, we've determined. Self-identified changes. Yes. And this is why we do this as an interactive, um, because it really shows you that there's more distribution going on in reality. Okay? So self-identify. Yay! Self-identify gender. <laughs> what a screw. <laughs> Is how you would define yourself. Is it purely female, purely male, or are you somewhere at one of my twos or fours? Yay. Okay. Um, orientation of attraction. Now we've we've gotten to where we've started breaking this down into attraction for friendship. Who do you prefer to hang out with? If you're just going to have a beer, men. Which, which the men, which? men are here. If, if attracted you're attracted to men. men. Yeah. Okay. You said which attraction? Who do you want to hang out with? Yeah. Okay. So we what well, we go ahead and go for when you when you just hear me say orientation of attraction, go go where you believe you should go. Female, male, and Whatever. Right in the okay. center, or a two or four, if you're kind of... What you're attracted to. What you're attracted to. Yeah. <laughs> but as I was saying, we've started breaking it down into attraction for friendships, because who we like to hang out with, and who we want to have a relationship with, and who we actually want to be intimate with, are different. They're very different. And the, but those are all orientations of attraction, for different reasons. Um, and I'm not going to make you move around for those right now. But... As you can see, <laughs> that changes. And I myself, okay, for, for these questions, um, assigned female, I identify as female, um, and my orientation of attraction is probably two for, for the basis of how I have this chart set up. Gender expression. How do you dress? And for this purpose, Let's, let's be honest, jeans and t-shirt is about as generic as you can get. It's, it's, most of us don't consider it androgynous, but it is. And that's how most people dress nowadays. And to be honest, I'm kind of like here and here and here. <laughs> yeah, and, and most of us do that. And, you know, then we could also break it down into, okay, well, are you, you know, more corporate in how you dress? Or are you... More stylish, you know. This is my idea of dressed up. Tuxedo. She's wearing her tux. <laughs> <laughs> I got dressed up for <laughs> for this. So, um, you know, it's how we choose to present ourselves to the world is saying more sometimes about who we think we are than what we say. Oh, I'm going the wrong direction. All right. So, as you can see, there was a lot of movement going on. Um, thank you for my volunteers. Oh, yeah, no, you got it right. That was it. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, now we get down to the societal concerns. And I'm not going to really bash religion here. That's not what we're about. But society rarely acknowledges continuums and spectrums. I mean, even when we're talking about colors, what do we use? We use color boxes. Maybe it's maybe we're not saying it's a binary, you know, black to white, but we're saying <coughs> red. And red is in this one box. Now, how many different shades of red are there? Infinite. <laughs> infinite. How many shades of yellow are there? Infinite. Okay, we could go at infinitum. <laughs> um, the key is, we think in terms of categorization, it is the easiest way to think. If you go back to the lizard brain, back and back to even just the tribal nature of human beings, there was friend or foe. 
And when somebody came into your tribe who was a little bit different, it was an evolutionarily selected behavior to question and potentially even kill somebody because your group would pass the genetics on and anybody from the outside is different. And so when you think about how we evolved, it's just normal. It's just human nature. But is it truth? That's what we have to get down to. Scientific method. We teach ourselves, even as scientists, to say, okay, you know what? I'm going to observe, test, and classify. Classification is a human activity. We try to do it to make sense of what we have. I mean, you know, if we have a difference between up and down, that helps us decide. If we have a difference between different forces and how they're pulling, that helps us determine the motion. That's all good. But for us to put value judgments on those boxes is not as good. Is up better than down? Now, if you watch the commercials, is big better than small? Um, it all depends on whether you work for AT&T or not. But, um, and, and talk to little children. <laughs> but you think about that ad, and that ad is enforcing a binary. Very, very common in humanity, but is it truth? When boxes don't fit, when you run into something that doesn't fit the box, if somebody is driving, straddling the dotted line on the road, does that bother you? <laughs> yeah, I've done that before. Lori's just looking at me. Um, when somebody doesn't fit the box, Frustration sets in for most people. I remember when I was transitioning from male to female and was presenting considerably more androgynous. It was amazing. People loved me. People would take cell phone pictures of me wherever I went. <laughs> Look at this shit. You know? <laughs> so um, people are upset by binary busters. People are upset by a person who's in the middle. I have friends who have gone into restrooms, basically identified as female at birth, identified themselves as, as female, but dressed on the masculine side or on the masculine side of things. So they've gotten kicked out of women's rooms, and they're girls in every conceivable sense, other than how somebody perceived them. So just think about that and how the binaries work and how frustrated people get when the binaries busted. What people usually do is erasure. If you don't like the fact that somebody's colored outside the lines, you teach them to color inside the lines and you erase what they did that was outside the lines. Here are just a couple of examples of erasure. And it's a very, very common tool in society. <coughs> we pathologize. Oh, this person's mentally ill. If you realize that in up until 1973, gays and lesbians were considered mentally ill, then all of a sudden, documents issued, stroke of the pen, they're cured. It was amazing. It was people, people talk about miracles. I believe in miracles. It happens. Well, genetic distortion. Genetic distortion. Please define that for me. Um, as people with diabetes are allowed to live rather than die through advances of medicine as people like me are allowed to see rather than be blind or almost blind uh, as we come up with some sort of a low evolved medical great majority of these uh, uh, medical advances are taken away after selection will again take over. But there was a pathology that I mean the thing is the pathologizing is human. Back before, back when people went blind, they went blind, but there wasn't a, you know, yeah, there was a, they were considered different. They were actually excluded from the rest of humanity in many ways. Is that the right thing? That's a form of erasure. You kind of park the crazy person in the upstairs attic, or you had the blind person over here, you had the leper colony or whatever. So pathologizing, though, what I'm saying is it is a form of erasure. 
And so yes, even with genetic issues, even with things like that, erasure is a problem, no matter what you're talking about. Belittling. Fag, dyke, kike, nigger. I said all those words, and I haven't gotten struck dead yet. <laughs> but belittling is a common form of erasure. It's a way of us putting ourselves apart from others and erasing them from our consideration. <coughs> The fact that one tiny characteristic of this vast cloud, this vast DNA of difference, of spectrum, we pick up this one point and say, because this person is darker skinned than I am, they are therefore no longer able to participate in my portion of society. That's erasure. That's taking people and erasing them just because of one aspect. And, you know, again, we call this gender 101, but it hits, this hits everywhere. Tokenizing. This is a really good one. Oh, we need more blacks. Okay. If you're valuing that person for who they are, that's great. But if you're valuing them because of a characteristic, you're tokenizing them. You're erasing them. You're bringing them in there so you can erase the stigma from your organization. Whereas if you say, no, you know what? We've got two people who are very, very qualified for this job. And one of them can provide something extra to our community just by, on the basis of their difference. That's not tokenizing. That's accepting, saying, OK, yeah, we need to learn this. But if all you're doing is, OK, we've got to check a box, <coughs> that's a form of erasure, even though it's seen as positive by some. Sexualizing. Um, people were shocked when I came out as a trans person. And so they would say, so you like men now? It's like, um, that part of me didn't change. The, the, my gender presentation, what you see has changed. Nothing else inside me has changed. Now some people do change. Some people get on hormones and all of a sudden they find out that their orientation does change. That's cool. But sexualizing of things. You know, if you take a gay man and all of a sudden, as soon as you hear that somebody is gay, you think, ooh, I don't like those sexual practices, so therefore that person is not comfortable for me to be around. That's erasing that person. Because guess what? They're not going to do those things when you're looking, most likely. <laughs> so why do we immediately pull up their sexual differences? And all of a sudden, they are no longer allowed to be in my society because or they're no longer allowed to have the same rights as I do, because. And there's an answer to this. And it involves stepping beyond the human nature. There's a more, there's a better way. And what I call it is active respect. When a person walks into a room that you don't know, Instead of just saying, okay, there's a new person, I can kind of avoid them because they're new, and I'm just going to go over to my friends. Um, I know people out there who say, you know what? You have to earn my respect. I don't respect anybody until they earn it. How many have heard that? How can you ever learn to respect a person without extending them at least a little bit of respect first? I would propose that a much better way of doing it is, I will respect you as a person the moment you walk into that room. If you prove to me that you don't deserve that respect, that's your choice, not mine. That's active respect. In Inherent in this, there is no understanding that has to be there. I don't have to understand a person. I don't have to know what they do behind closed doors or who they want to be attracted to or who they know themselves to be despite what they're presenting. I presented myself to the world as a white dude for 40 years. It never fit. I was a bit of an asshole because of it because I was constantly dealing with them, knowing the people, if they knew me for who I was, would reject me out of hand. There are other people in this room who feel the same way or who have felt the same way. Where you know, That's why coming out of the closet is so tough for lesbians and gays. 
Because as soon as people know about you, you're, you're not changing when you come out of the closet. You're changing everybody else's perceptions. Activism is inherent in active respect. You cannot actively respect somebody and hold to a neutralist position. If you're going to actively respect, you're going to be in a place like this, where people are respected for who they are, where people can walk in here and, cool, well, you're different. I like that. I need to learn from you. Whereas other places where I've been, and I've been kicked out of certain places like this, um, basically, they're not activists. They're more pacifists. They're more come into our fold and be like us. Join the group and kind of conform. Activism is necessary for active respect. And then, of course, open-mindedness and personal humility. Because as soon as you say, I'm better than somebody else because you've kind of lost your active respect cred right away. Because humility is necessary to understand others. There are several ways, like for the now going back into gender, I mean, how many of you, how many of you have ever heard of Transgender Day of Remembrance? I figured there'd be a couple. Um, every year, November 20th, transgender people around the world celebrate, not celebrate, mourn the lives of those who have been murdered for a difference in gender expression over the last year. Every year, those we know of, the list is, you know, up in the hundreds. And that's only the ones that are reported. It's usually closer to three. It's usually in the three to, two to three hundred range. Um, how many of you have ever been to a Pride event? Okay, we celebrate Pride. We mourn our losses. Um, the key is that activism is necessary for active respect. And so, coming out as atheist puts you outside of a box for many people. And how many people are truly atheists? We're all the same, right? Atheists all do the exact same thing. <laughs> no. The box, the box doesn't work. We need to get away from the boxes and realize that if a person is atheist, <coughs> still be a sexist, bigoted, <laughs> because the boxes don't work. Being one thing doesn't make you automatically good. Being a good person makes you good. And guess what? We all have those parts of us that you still use boxes. My boxes changed when I came out. I became more anti the Christian box. And I have to watch out for that. So, now Lori can join you back up here. Anything more you want to say, well, I was, and we'll go to questions. Before we go into questions, um, we've got an assortment of books. Uh, on the back table. I used to loan some of them out and they don't come back. So we don't loan them anymore, uh, but they're there for you to look at. And further in the PowerPoint, we have a list of books, a list of websites, movies, um, different recommendations. And I have a list back there uh, if you'd like us to email the PowerPoint directly to you. And uh, we are going to provide it to Mike so he can put it out for everyone as well. Um, and I have cards back there that have my email address on them if you want to ask questions <coughs> privately. If, you, if there's a question you have you don't want to ask publicly today, you can address it to Brenda using my email. If you send it to her email, she'll never see it. Um, <laughs> it's, so it's a work email. <laughs> um, so that's why we use my email. And if you want to ask both of us, that's fine. Or if you want to ask her specifically, just address it to her and I'll make sure she sees it. But she'll actually see it that way. Um, so that's an option if there's something you want to ask that you you are uncomfortable asking publicly, we are available for that as well. So all that's on the back table. Now, go for it. Questions? Okay, we're going to start at this side. Go ahead. Okay, uh, in the last slide you said that for the uh, transgender remembrance day, there were hundreds, the list was in the hundreds for those killed each year. Is that the U.S. only or globally? Um, in the past four of the, I believe, 13 or 14 years it's been going on, we've been getting more and more in from global. And okay. so that is global. Just but again, true. many aren't reported even here in the U.S. The reason um, many of them aren't reported is um, a lot of times if someone dies, their family chooses how they are remembered. 
and their family chooses how their information is put in an obituary, they choose how they're buried, um, and so their identity is completely erased at the time of death, and so that's why there's there's an underreporting. One one reason why. There's yes. That. In the past, you know, weeks, months, when the re news reports on on changing mm -hmm. attitudes toward universal marriage in this country, <coughs> reporting. Yes. Uh, I have found it over and over. Um, the, um, the fact that individuals in the, in the public eye have changed their attitudes as politicians, have changed their attitudes because of knowing someone, having personal contact with, with people. It, 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 I find that really, really interesting, not, not shocking at all. And I find it really positive. That, you know, that shows, that's a positive thing about respect and, and about, it, I find it really interesting. It's very hard to erase somebody who is right in front of you. That's why it's very hard for a person, once they actually know that a person that they love is different, it's very hard for them to push that away. Now, some people, my parents included, have told me never to come back. That's a form of erasure. They, they have to erase one way or another, or they have to learn to accept and actively respect. And so, yes, that's what's actually happening. People are, I can no longer erase this person. And that's really what it is. Well, and as you said earlier, um, you were presented as a show and tell as an atheist because they've never met an atheist. Yeah. Well, I guarantee you they had. Yeah. yeah, I guarantee you that they had. Right, no, but I'm, I'm yeah. using here as an example. Um, and I guarantee you, you've met someone who's trans, who's lesbian, who's gay, whether you think you have or not. Um, and that's what we need to remember, is you already know someone. Why do you have to know them by name in order to respect that group of people? Okay, we're still going across. I had a question just about language and um, how um, you prefer to refer to yourself. Or there's like a gender queer and trans and it's all very confusing. Yeah, you know what, I chose not to go into that because I wanted to get more in the binary busting here, but yeah, there are so many different terms out there. Um, first of all, what I'd like to say is if you know somebody, you want to talk to them, and you're not sure how to refer to them, ask them. I personally was never offended when somebody would ask me. I might get a little self-conscious, like, oh, isn't it obvious that I'm female? But no, ask them. Um, and then the thing is, there are also, I mean, there are people who flip back and forth between genders. There are, there's another thing that is out there, and again, pardon my language, but this is a term that's out there in the community, it's gender fuck. It's a person who, like, say a, a, a dude with a beard walking down the street in a dress with a purse, and combat dudes. They're playing with gender. It's fun for them. And so, ask them, how do you want to be referred to? with all this. And one of the, the links that we suggest um, has a dictionary of terms. And that's why we don't go into all of it, because there are so many. But it's got a complete dictionary of terms. We've got a, a link for that on there. So, this is for either one of you. Um, I have heard you know, over the weeks that I've been coming to Oasis, a lot of people who are new to non-theism, or maybe they're just only recently realized non-theists, compare their experience to that of gays coming out of the closet. Like if you go out in public and you say it out loud, I don't think there's a God anymore. It's a very scary and maybe brave thing to do. I can't really compare that to the depth of the experience of the gay or transgender person, but do you think, do you think it Shares some analogs. It's worse. Maybe it's worse. It's worse. It's worse. <laughs> We're here to tell us. <laughs> okay, I mean, I guess I've, 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 I've had to come out three or four times to my family as lesbian because they just won't believe me. Um, and yeah, that was difficult and it was frightening, but it's less difficult than coming out as atheist. Less backlash. As I was describing, I made a joke earlier, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it is a okay, social it's a questionable taste. But the lesbians recruit children, atheists eat them. <laughs> that's, that's kind of sums up why. So actually, if you were to ask me, it's in stages. Well, one thing that people realize, 
or at least they start to realize after a while, is that if you're lesbian or gay, there's likely something that's just inherent about that in you. Okay? If you're trans, I knew from the moment there was a difference between boys and girls, which line and which bathroom I was supposed to be in and which one I was told to be in. It was inherent. Religion, or lack thereof, is a choice. And you are making a choice against them. My parents, my parents don't know that I'm atheist. They still ask me to pray for things. When in those very few, like once or twice a year, they even talk to me, and usually it's because I've called them. So if I would come to them as atheist, the line would be completely cut because that's a that's a true choice. Even though religion is really not a choice, most people have a religion because of where they're born. Oh, yeah, we're all born atheists. We're all born right. without a religion, right. without a religion. And, and it's indoctrinated. Yes. yes. Um, how would you identify, and this is somewhat personal, uh, in terms of your dealing with homosexuality uh, and relate that to racism? And when I see, when I talk about racism, I'm talking about white supremacy. Uh, so, how do you identify or kind of correlate this this situation with the plight of racism? Uh, how do you have you have you felt any identity to black people in America in regards to? I feel like I have, and I'm always trying to be very aware of my own privilege as I assume that connection um, because I'm not sure how far I'm allowed to take it. Um, I feel like there is a, a definite connection. Uh, but then you get into, some people say that homosexuality is a choice and, and the color of your skin is not. And I would disagree. Neither of them is a choice. But I have the privilege of blending in. I have the privilege of being light-skinned and being accepted in a light-skinned preferential society um, that a black person does not have. So I'm aware that that correlation can only go so far. On the other hand, when you're trans, you're usually visible. And I feel there's more of a correlation between race and trans because it's visible. Um, I had to give up a lot of privilege to transition from male to female. Not only privilege of male, but also privilege of humanity because my femaleness is, is rejected. But it's still not as visible as skin color. I think there's much more correlation between the homosexual issue and misogyny than yeah. there is between that and, and race. Um, so if, if you look at the issues, <coughs> most of them are misogyny-based. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if someone who's transitioning from <coughs> male to female, well, they're giving up their male privilege. Well, who would do that? Who would want to give up a penis? Um, someone who's, who's transitioning from female to male, well, they just want a penis, you know, because that's where all the power is. Um, and they just want to be a man. Well, you know, good for them. You know, um, it's different. Really looking is. down on on gay men, it's usually because some straight guy is afraid that gay guy is going to treat them the way they treat women. Um, so there's I mean, some of the, the issues are wrapped up in the misogyny of that. So I see much more of a correlation between the misogyny, you know, the misogyny, the feminist issues, and and homosexuality. Than I do race issues, but I do still feel like there's a connection. Let's do one more question. Yeah. Okay, one more question, Walt. Um, is there any relationship between those remembered during Transgender Day and those declitorized in Islamic countries? Mm -hmm. um, Transgender Day, remember, it only deals with death for gender identity. There, that's enough to deal with on that one day. I mean, basically, it's you're crying the whole time you're remembering. There needs to be a memorialization of those who are gen gen genitally mutilated by whatever <coughs> how about circumcision by Jewish people and Christians. Is that genital mutilation of children to a lesser scale 
But still, why are we doing things to people against their will, without their consent? To me, the act of respect, consent, it's really simple to me. I don't know. <laughs> All right, let's make it up. So, so much. It was great. It's actually, second time I've seen the presentation, and I found that this is thought, probably more thought provoking the second time around. Uh, thing. Maybe, maybe someday, you know, we could do a follow up thing. Because I think you've generated so much to think about and talk about, and as we get a chance to process it. Um, but we'll stay in touch with you. Uh, 